sponsored by Brilliant. What you're about to see is one of the hardest, most frustrating projects I've done. This is maybe going to be a little harder than I thought it would be. Uh-oh. I just, I just, I don't know how to do this part of the video. All right. I don't think I'm going to fix this problem tonight. Oh, no. <laughs> this was the worst day I have ever had at FAR. Okay. Okay, rolling. Um, so I've had this idea for like a little while. Anyone who knows me knows I get I get down with hot glue. I'm I'm down cataclysmic. And so the idea is like, what if the whole rocket is hot glue? What if we do the airframe and the nose cone and the fins out of hot glue? I think my first step here is gonna have to be making sure that I have like the mold situation down. So there's this mold release that I Oopsie, you're going to jail for rambling too much. Let me explain this more clearly. We're gonna make this rocket in several sections. Nose cone, airframe, and fins. We'll split it up this way to get a better shape, smoother surface finish, and it'll make production easier. So let's start with the largest part, the airframe. I started with a basic test. One layer of hot glue on a 3D printed mold of a curved section. Using a special mold release, I prevented it from bonding with the 3D print, and the results were terrible. Way too flimsy. In large rockets, if you want more stiffness from your tanks while keeping weight low, you can shape the material into an isogrid or orthogrid, then form that panel around a curve. So let's try that. Using my favorite CAD program on shape, I created a 3D printed isogrid mold, coated it in mold release, and then filled it slowly with hot glue. Uh, this is demolded. It feels okay. This is the way that I pulled it out of the mold. I'm definitely concerned about stiffness. I mean, no surprise here, hot glue is not crazy stiff, but this is gonna be a really bendy rocket. I feel like hot glue should get more stiff when it's cold. Let me toss this in the freezer and see what happens. All right, big news, very exciting. Hear this? That's not someone knocking at the door. That is much more stiff hot glue. So I'm thinking, you know how some- Nope, you're going right back to rambling jail. Here's the point. We're gonna keep the rocket cold before it launches to increase stiffness. Look, I saved you eight minutes of me rambling in that room. Back to the video. With this in mind, I hopped back into Onshape, redesigned the mold to span 180 degrees of curvature, then switched from a 3D printed design to aluminum. You'll see why I did this in just a minute. With the inner isogrid mold complete, all that's left to do is finish the outer mold, which gets milled from aluminum. Then it's finally time to melt some hot glue. Each airframe section comes from the same mold. The parts get peeled off while they're still warm and bendy, and then the flashing or excess glue is removed. 
To take these two halves and make them whole, I coated a mandrel in mold release, and then I used that to join the sections together, forming cylinders. I then slide these cylinders down a mandrel, and then glue them one on top of another. This tube section will go near the top of the rocket, so I cut a hole for a camera to capture video of the flight. I also added a small commercial flight computer called an Easy Mini. It'll sense how high the rocket goes and deploy parachutes at the peak of flight. The Easy Mini uses changes in air pressure to detect whether the rocket has launched or not. Ah, uh, actually, one more more time, the Easy Mini uses changes in air pressure to detect whether the rocket has launched or not. Okay, I wanted to make sure that we had that covered. Let's move on. Because of this, I drilled several vent holes in the electronics bay to make sure that the computer could read accurate atmospheric pressure. Next up, nose cone. Let's keep it real simple here. I designed the shape I wanted using Onshape, and then I 3D printed a mold and filled it to the brim with hot glue. Along the way, I embedded some Kevlar cord to attach it to the rest of the rocket. Finally, we need some fins. I melted down half inch thick sheets of hot glue in the toaster, then made my friend Charlie do the hard work of cutting them out. With some fillets on the fins to improve strength, rail guides on the side, to keep it upright, and a parachute designed to shoot out the back, we headed out to the Friends of Amateur Rocketry test site. For maximum hot glue stiffness, we need to keep the rocket cold before launch. So at the site, I filled a shipping tube with dry ice, put the rocket inside, and then chilled the fins with cereal boxes filled with dry ice as well. After a little while in my makeshift freezer, we got the rocket on the pad, powered on the electronics, and got ready to go. I'm gonna dump the rest of that on this side. Right. And we, we have just about enough. Right, so we're gonna rip everything off, we're gonna go vertical, igniter goes in, and we're ready. All right, you ready? Fins feel good. Two lead and no fire. So now I put it in the Good. Let's stand back and see if anything else is gonna happen. Wow! Yeah, the nozzle's all uh, hit there, so. Yeah. Okay, for, for everybody saying, this is why when you buy a rocket, I predict it. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put a timer up here. I know that it's tempting to skip this part of the video, but it's important and just take a deep breath and sit with me for a second. Rocketry has inherent risk. There are things that just are going to be dangerous about rocketry. So what we do is we try to mitigate that risk. We come up with workarounds and we come up with procedures that keep us safe. When you see me at the launch pad wearing sunglasses, it's not just because I want to look cool, it's also eye protection in case something like that happens. When you see me standing in front of the rocket and I say, I shouldn't stand here. That's a recognition of the inherent risk involved. There's no igniter in that rocket motor. The computer isn't on. I'm just thinking about how there's some inherent risk to being around rockets, so don't stand in front or behind them. The second part of this is good decision making, and this is the part that I failed at, so let's make sure we walk through the chain of events and understand how this happened. The flight computer is a commercial device that uses barometric pressure changes to detect changes in altitude and thus fire the parachutes. The first thing it does, though, is detect whether the rocket has launched or not. Not. Barometric altitude is not usually that accurate. Sometimes it can be off by five, maybe 10 meters. In the user manual for the device, it states that it should be powered on when the rocket is vertical, and frankly, this is fairly common for most rockets. But knowing that barometric pressure doesn't change much between zero feet and five feet, I deemed it safe enough to power it on horizontal and then move it to the vertical position. That is the bad decision right there. If you're gonna go against the user manual, you need to make sure you thoroughly test your theory, and I didn't test that. So what happened is that we raised the rocket vertical on the rail, and then the device has a 25 second lockout before it can detect apogee. So exactly 25 seconds after I raised the rocket vertical is when the motor shot out the back as the computer believed the rocket was at the peak of flight and it was time to deploy the parachutes. As I said, before, this one is on me. I made a mistake. I want to make sure you understand what that mistake was, and then we can all get a little bit better by understanding that. When you hide your failures, no one learns. When you talk about them, it stings a little bit, but it's worthwhile and everyone gets a little better. Thank you for sticking with me through this timer. Now let's get back to the video. 
For the next attempt, I wanted to make several changes. First up, I switched to a less powerful rocket motor with an ejection charge integrated, which means we don't need that flight computer anymore. The motor will do it for us. Next, we need a better way to cool this rocket down. The cereal boxes are okay, but this looks disgusting and wildly unprofessional. I took that same shipping tube, cut out slots for the fins, and then put cardboard around where the fins would stick out. This will let us cover the entire vehicle with ice, and then when we're ready to launch, I can take that whole shipping tube assembly, rip it off the rocket, run back to the camera, and go for launch. Here, I'm testing this out with regular ice, not dry ice, just wet ice. It, I don't like that. I don't, it's, don't call it wet ice. But everything seems to work great here, so after some slight repairs to the back of the rocket, which had a few cracks after the last attempt, I went out to the Friends of Amateur Rocketry test site for attempt number two. For this attempt, I filled the entire tube on the launch pad up with dry ice, as well as surrounding the fins with dry ice. I wanted plenty of time for this dry ice to get the vehicle nice and cold, so I left it in this configuration for about an hour and 15 minutes. During that time, I moved around setting up cameras, and about 10 minutes before launch, I checked on the rocket in the tube. Uh-oh. Oh no, it broke. Oh no. <laughs> Wow, dude, it's so bad. <laughs> so it entirely fractured. The whole thing, like without shaking or moving it, the whole thing came apart. Here's my parachutes. You can hear it cracking. It's like thermal stress that's just splitting it all apart. Oh, crap. That is crazy. Incredible. This is a, a much harder project than I thought it would be. It's like these thin, wow, yeah, you can hear it. If I hold it, it stresses the material enough that it fractures. So like, it's just breaking apart like that. Yeah, this is tough. <sighs> All right. Uh... I knew it was risky to try the dry ice. I did not think it would fracture that bad. To address the elephant in the room, we're doing this again. I'm building another one. It's not over till it's over, and it's not over till it flies. I'm Joey B. I don't really give up. When my landing model rocket didn't work a billion times in a row, I didn't give up. I tried until it worked. When the silo launched model rocket didn't work the first time, didn't work the second time, I didn't stop there. I tried a third time, and this hot glue rocket didn't work the first and second time, but damn it, I'm gonna make it work on the third. Okay, let's go. Ugh. Version two only needs a few changes. We'll stick with three fins and build the rest of the rocket the same as last time. We'll shorten the rocket overall to increase stiffness, and to compensate for stability, we'll make the nose cone heavier by embedding lead weights. Finally, we'll use a less powerful rocket motor, which unfortunately also has a less powerful ejection charge. And with all that covered, I drove out to FAR the night before the launch. This is a video about a rocket made of hot glue. It's also a video about an unwillingness to give up. Over the next few years, I'm building a rocket that will fly over 100 kilometers, all the way to space. And there is nothing easy about that task. Along the way, I'll face failure, setbacks, delays. The project will have issues and frustrations about problems I've never dreamt of. 
And the only way to the finish line, the only way to space, will be through an unwillingness to give up. So my goal is to practice that attitude everywhere I can. Good luck, dude. And in that spirit, on the third attempt, (laughs) check out this rocket I made out of hot glue. That undersized ejection charge was just not enough to get the parachutes out. But I'm still gonna call this a win. The rocket's coming home in one piece, and frankly, I got bigger fish to fry. Thanks for watching. This video is sponsored by Brilliant. You've probably seen me work with Brilliant before as a sponsor, and the reason that I keep doing it is because I really believe in what they do. And at the end of this, I'll have an offer for you where you can try Brilliant for free. As a quick recap, Brilliant is an interactive platform built around the idea of learning by doing. And that is the whole video that you just watched. That's everything on this channel. It's all learning by doing. When you see me try something and then I fail, I figure out what went wrong, and then we move forward with some new knowledge, that's all learning by doing, and that's what Brilliant's all about. When you spend time solving problems that have some tangible application or an interactive component, not just some textbook problem, you end up much more motivated to learn, and I find personally it's a lot more effective for me. Brilliant is one of the best ways you can learn math, data science, computer science, and all of the exercises are interactive. There's no shortage of courses you can try. There are literally thousands of lessons, I'm not kidding, thousands on the platform, and these lessons are anywhere from basic to advanced topics, so you can jump in at any skill level. I've been trying to learn more about deep learning algorithms lately, and Brilliant has a great course on LLMs, or large language models, that you can try out. And if you want to give Brilliant a shot, you can do that totally for free for the first 30 days by going to brilliant.org slash BPS space. You can also click the link in the description down below, and the first 200 people to do that will get 20% off an annual premium subscription to Brilliant. Thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. Thank you to you for watching. My name is Joe Barnard. May your skies be blue and your winds be low.